On February 21st, the Japan Society hosted an event featuring Naomi Pollock, a world renowned expert on contemporary Japanese architecture. Her new book, The Japanese House Since 1945, explores exceptional homes created by Japanese architects after World War II. During the event, Pollock shared stories about these remarkable residencies and engaged in a discussion with Yoko Kawai, an expert in Japanese designs and a lecturer at the Yale School of Architecture. Uh, well, thank you everybody for joining our program, Japan Houses, Stories of Remarkable Homes and the People Who Made Them. Uh, I'm Steve Pollock, and I'm the president of Japan Society of Northern California. And I would like to thank our co-sponsors for this program, uh, Japan Society of Boston, Japan America Society of Houston, uh, Japan America Society of Minnesota, and Japan America Society of Washington. We are all kind of in the same business of promoting uh, connections between the U.S. and Japan, but we each operate independently and autonomously. So thank you for uh, your support and participation in today's program. Uh, well, I'm very excited about this program today. I'm, I'm not an architectural expert, uh, but like many people, I think one of my first, uh, you know, encounters with Japan was seeing, uh, you know, uh, design uh, reflected in its buildings and architecture. You know, a lot of my experience initially was with traditional buildings in Japan, uh, temples, gates, castles, uh, villas, uh, imperial villas, machia, uh, of course, many different types of gardens, which are so important to the Japanese aesthetic. Uh, but when I lived in Japan with my family in Tokyo uh, between 2016 and 2018, uh, one of my favorite activities was to go on walks around the neighborhood. And I was really struck by the, the incredible diversity of contemporary housing that exists uh, in Japan, not just in urban Japan, but throughout the country. And uh, there are so many buildings and structures that really seemed at odds with what I thought of as Japanese architecture. You know, they had strange shapes uh, squeezed into tiny spaces, uh, bubble windows or no windows, um, angular roofs, uh, impossibly narrow buildings that were kind of squeezed into a crack between uh, other buildings or uh, you know highways and other spaces and uh, buildings that were made of poured concrete and in some cases had no you know no visible external windows whatsoever. I was just really fascinated by you know how different these uh, buildings seemed to be. And so when I uh, learned about Naomi Pollock's amazing book, uh, The Japanese House Since 1945. I was really excited. Um, this book is 400 pages long. It dives uh, deeply into the history of Japanese residential architecture since World War II and presents profiles of nearly 100 different uh, and truly remarkable buildings in Japan. It shows a large number of uh, you know, Japanese architects who really created something incredibly uh, different uh, using uh, traditional building techniques or new building techniques and also adapting to the unique needs of and constraints of the Japanese environment to create a long list of buildings that had influence much beyond Japan uh, using different materials, uh, adapting to policy and space constraints within the Japanese environment. Um, and really, uh, you know, using distinctly Japanese uh, uh, elements uh, to meet uh, the needs of uh, Japanese people and, and kind of their living space. Um, her book is really, you know, truly a um, not not just a wonderfully produced book, but it also has great stories and visuals about the buildings that she covers, uh, including floor plans of all the buildings. You know, numerous pictures of the buildings. And one of the things I really enjoyed was stories and uh, accounts of people who actually created these buildings and or lived in the buildings uh, you know, that were created. And so it's, it's really a great read and I would recommend uh, that anybody who has an interest in this topic consider getting a copy of her book. It's, it's a, wonderful, uh, a wonderful piece and something I think is, is uh, really insightful about um, you know, Japanese uh, residential architecture in Japan. So we're very pleased uh, to be able to put on this program and from the large number of people who registered and are still showing up for the program, it seems like there was a strong interest uh, in this topic as well. So let me introduce uh, Naomi Pollock, uh, who is no relation to me, although we share her last name, is uh, truly a world expert in the field of Japanese architecture and design. She is the author of 10 different books and hundreds of articles. And although she currently resides in Chicago, she spent 30 years uh, living and working in Japan with her family. She is a licensed architect herself and is also an expert in Japanese textiles, uh, design and furniture, among other things. Uh, she holds master's degrees in architecture from the Harvard Graduate School of Design and the University of Tokyo's Graduate School of Engineering. Uh, thank you so much, Naomi, for joining us today and sharing your expertise. 
And she is also joined today by Yoko Kawai, a lecturer at the Yale School of Architecture and a principal of Penguin Environmental Design. Uh, Yoko is a perfect interlocutor for this event. She grew up in Japan and came to the US in 1990 uh, for her master's degree and has resided here since 2001. Uh, like many of the architects profiled in Naomi's wonderful book, uh, Yoko has a passion for combining architecture with nature. And she is always looking for ways to connect inside with outside, which is a theme that you can see repeated in many of the houses that are profiled in the book. She works with her husband, who is a landscape architect, and together they focus on both residential and workspace design with the goal of creating space that contributes uh, to well-being. So thank you both of you for joining us today. And what we will do is uh, Naomi is going to make a, a, a presentation about some of the uh, buildings that she covers in her book. Uh, she will then have a conversation with Yoko uh, about uh, her work and, and uh, architecture in Japan. And then we will open the conversation to those of you in attendance who wish to ask questions of, of Yoko and Naomi. So let me uh, pass it over to uh, Naomi and uh, thank you again for joining us today. Thank you so much, Steve for that absolutely wonderful introduction. I also want to thank the Japan Society of Northern California and all of the co-sponsors for making this event possible today. And lastly, I want to thank all of you who are here somewhere out there in cyberspace. So thank you for coming. My plan today is to tell you a little bit about my story, a little bit about my book, and then take you inside some of its pages. In many respects, the origin of this book traces back to my first days in Japan when I was a graduate student at Tokyo University on a scholarship from the Ministry of Education in Japan. And I have a very vivid memory of my first encounter with my academic advisor, who was Pro Professor Hiroshi Hara. At that time, he was one of two practicing architects on the faculty at Tokyo University. And this took place in his seminar room which is a very long, skinny room with a very long, skinny table down the middle. And Professor Hara sat on one side of this long, skinny table, and I sat on the other. And he has a rather monotone voice, and he just said to me, so what is it you want to study? And I said to him a little bit meekly that I wanted to study why Japanese buildings look so strange. Because similar to Steve, I had a very you know, a very similar kind of uh, first impression. Um, the buildings in Tokyo did not seem to have any relationship to each other at all. There were no uniform street walls. Geometrically, they were not in, they weren't particularly compatible. Materials didn't carry over. And um, a lot of them just seemed to be vying for attention and had these crazy slanted roofs. And I just, you know, really couldn't make heads or tails of it. So without skipping a beat, Professor Hara said to me, um, well, if you want to understand the contemporary, you have to look to the historical. And I said, great. And I ended up doing my thesis on Minka farmhouses, which are these marvelous thatch roofed farmhouses that are distributed all over Japan. Um, but that still didn't quite, you know, scratch the itch of what was going on with contemporary architecture. So very early on in my stay, I discovered that there's a marvelous custom in Japan that architects often, when they've completed a project, a day or two before they're going to um, turn it over to the client, they open it up for a kengakukai or open house. And they invite everyone. They invite journalists, they invite professors, they invite their students, they invite their parents, they invite critics, um, and they invite graduate students like me. So I made it my own private curriculum to go to as many of these Ken Gakukai as I possibly could. And it brought me up to speed pretty quickly because I saw a lot of new buildings and a lot of houses, some of which are actually in this book. And it also gave me a chance to launch my writing career because there were so many people outside of Japan who were so hungry for information about Japanese architecture and design. So since that time, I've been writing up a storm as Steve said, this book is my 10th book. And, um, oops. Um, oh, whoops, gotta go back. Uh, so this is my 10th book. And um, 
it um, started with a very simple, straightforward idea. And the idea I had was, in my mind, I was imagining if I could take the 100 most impactful buildings um, designed by architects in Japan from 1945 to the present, what would that lineup look like? Quoting from the foreword that Tadao Ando wrote, I wanted to study that unbroken chain of creativity as one generation of houses turned into the next. And so that gave me the structure of the book. It has um, nine chapters, each one dedicated to uh, a decade. And within each chapter, there are profiles of um, the, the most impactful houses of that decade. This includes written text as well as photos and drawings. And um, the houses I selected, well, some of them were, you know, low hanging fruit. It was pretty obvious that they were going to be in the book because they were so important. But mostly I was I was searching for homes that had a lasting impact on architects, on homeowners, and even outside Japan. Basically, I was looking for the thoroughbreds not the zebras. But more than architectural concepts or construction technology, I really wanted to grasp the experience of these houses. What was it like to be here, to live here? Well, obviously to investigate this, I had to talk to people. And so I talked to the architects wherever possible, but of course, many of the architects whose work is in the book are no longer living. So then I turned to their former staff, their students. I talked to academics and critics who were familiar with their work. I talked to their family members. I talked to their clients. And in one case, I even talked to the client's housekeeper. All of these people shared wonderful anecdotes and I put as many of them into the texts as I could. Another way I got at the experience were um, these uh, invited essays, we call them the at-home essays, where I invited people who'd actually lived in these homes to write about the experience. Sometimes it was the architects themselves, sometimes it was the children of the architects, sometimes it was clients, um, but they shared wonderful stories. You know, among my favorites is, um, you know, Michiko Uchida describing um, playing under the piloti, the columns of her childhood home, which was designed by her father, Kenzo Tange, or Pumi Hikomaki um, and his daughter, Naomi, both wrote about the experience of the two-generation home that Mr. Maki first designed for his own family and his parents, and now is lived in by Mr. Maki and his wife and their daughter, Naomi, and her family. And then, of course, there's a story that um, the architect Kasuhiro Miyamoto shared about his home, which is a small um, wooden house built in the early part of the 20th century in Takorozaka, not far from Kobe. And the house was seriously damaged in the Great Hanshin earthquake in 1995. And like most of these very damaged properties, the government was all ready to tear it down. And um, the architect sort of stood up and said, no, no, no we can't tear this house down. It's been in my family uh, for three or four generations. It's full of memory. And instead he propped it up with this massive steel structure that he literally put in and around the building and painted it white. And he tells the story of this, um, this house that he renamed house surgery appropriately. And we were very lucky that all of the uh, contributors also loaned us informal snapshots so we could see the houses in action, um, which are some of my favorite pictures. But the bulk of the 544 illustrations had to be sourced by me and my photo assistant. Um, we only, we made a decision early on, we were only going to use existing photos and drawings. Um, and Partly I wanted this very badly because this creates a sort of parallel visual timeline. As you see um, the black and white photos and the hand-drawn plans in the forties gradually become color photos and the drawings turn into digital data. 
Um, so, you know, among the photos are many iconic images, but we also found many photos that had been long forgotten or in some cases never seen. Well, one question I'm often asked is, why does the book start in 1945? Well, obviously that was the year the war ended and the year that reconstruction started. Um, as we know, physically after the war, the devastation was catastrophic and especially where, you know, there was an urgent need to rebuild homes, but there was not much money and materials were scarce. Um, the Japanese government did what they could to offset this by setting up loans of various types for people who wanted to rebuild their homes. Naturally, those came with some restrictions, um, but um, at least it was gave some people a foothold. Um, but it was also a time of tremendous social and political change. Among the changes that impacted architects and impacted house design was the shift of the family structure, the pre-war patriarchal multi-generation family living under one roof was swapped out for this new Western idea of the um, nuclear family with two parents and two children. Another area that was hotly debated was the separation of eating and sleeping because in the traditional house, these activities could occur in the same room um, with a simple switch of zabuton cushions for futon mattresses, they could be switched, the function could be switched back and forth. But this was viewed as unhygienic. So again, people who were building homes were encouraged to separate sleeping and eating. So as you can see, this was an, a time, yes, there was a time of great hardship, but it, as far as architects were concerned, it was a chance to modernize the home but more importantly, to think about what a house could actually be. One of the most early um, important thinkers was an architect named Kiyoshi Ikebe. And one of his major contributions was he promoted moving the kitchen into the center of the house. Previously, it had been tucked away in a dark corner. Maybe it was out in the doma, the, the um, you know transitional space between an inside and outside, but you know he said no. Let's put the kitchen in the center of the, the home where it can be a gathering place for this new nuclear family. And um, what you see here is his Ikebe's house number one. He did not um, give his homes names. He simply numbered them. And this was created in 1948 in compliance with the size and material constraints imposed by the government for those who were qualifying for loans. So as you can see, it's made of wood and glass and concrete block, materials that were relatively um, affordable and available at that time. And it was only about 540 square feet, which you know is, is extremely small, but it was not viewed in Ikebe's eyes as a hardship. On the contrary, I spoke with his daughter, um, who is also a design professional, and she explained that her father was always inspired by um, tea house architecture. And anyone familiar with the traditional tea house knows that it's a very small space designed for a very um, prescribed or well choreographed sequence of movements. And um, he liked that idea, that compactness, and that was sort of his image in his mind while he was um, creating this house. But you can see here, these are two slices through the building. Um, if you look on the left, uh, that drawing, um, you can see that the roof is slanted. And that became a real signature of Ikebe's architecture. Um, in this tiny little house, slanting the roof you know, gave was a, quite a brilliant idea because first of all, it enabled him to create some kind of hierarchy among spaces by changing the ceiling height. And second of all, by putting the um, bedrooms upstairs, he could even have a little bit of privacy. Um, well, by the 1950s, the immediate crisis had waned and restrictions had loosened. 
and commissions for architects were starting to expand and grow. Um, this was a house designed by an architect named Kiyonori Kikutake for his own family, and it's in Tokyo. It still exists, looks quite a bit different today, but this is how it started out. And essentially, it was one big square room that was elevated on these massive concrete pillars and surrounded by a covered porch on all four sides, much like a traditional Engawa porch. And internally, um, the house could be divided with furniture or movable partitions, but he also augmented the space with something that he invented, which was called the move net. And the move net were these boxes that could be moved slid along the perimeter of this square room and plugged in at various places. And one contained the bathroom and one, as you see here, contained the kitchen. Now, how often these boxes actually got moved, not entirely clear, but as a concept, it was, um, it was you know, a pretty innovative idea. Um, subsequently, he created another set of move nets, and these were wooden boxes that were suspended from the floor of the main space. And um, this was his daughter's room because the, they created he created these move nets when they had children and needed children's bedrooms. And um, when she saw this picture, she told me how much she loved that room and what a great place it was to be a kid in a kid sized space you know, with room for all her treasures and um, she really loved it. Well, by the sixties, Japan was solidly on the up and up. The country was gearing up to host the Olympics in 1964. The economy was growing rapidly. Consumers had disposable income. And this meant that now they could afford to build homes that were more than mere shelter or an answer to basic needs. As the architect who was practicing at that, who started, well, he really started his practice around the, the 60s, um, who designed a lot of houses, that was Kazuo Shinohara. He wrote in an essay in the mid 60s that um, a house could be a work of art. And this is uh, Shinohara's umbrella house, which is in was in suburban Tokyo. And it is really a good illustration of his statement. Um, it also was a house where he was exploring, how do I blend familiar traditional elements with modern architecture? So you see in this picture on the left side, those are sliding paper fusuma doors, traditional element. There's a sudare reed um, shade that's being used to divide uh, the room delicately. And then overhead, you see um, these beams, which are clearly inspired by the kind of Minka farmhouses that had um, huge wooden scaffolding. They're, in, their, in those traditional settings, they were more of a 3D matrix. And here, as you can see, the beams are um, splayed out as if you know, mimicking the spokes of a traditional umbrella. But um, as I said, he also was interested in making modern homes. And as you can see, the interior was quite light and quite white, and it had um, a state-of-the-art kitchen. Well, one of the book's most compelling houses is this one. It was built by um, an architect named Toyo Ito in 1976. It is also in Tokyo. And he designed this house for his sister and her two daughters shortly after the death of her husband and their father. And they really wanted a home where they could feel protected. So Toyo Ito created this you of concrete. I mean, it doesn't even look like a home, it has very few windows and very little, uh, you know, a lot of privacy. And for, you know, it was Ito's way of creating a house that could nurture his family when they were in the throes of grief. 
And as you can see, the U, um, it sort of surrounds this courtyard, but it wasn't a courtyard in the sense of a habitable space. It was never planted and it was left empty dirt just to look at and connect with the ground. And um, by contrast, the interior had very few partitions just in rooms where it was essential, maybe the bedrooms, the kitchen. Uh, instead, the, the different functional areas just sort of flowed from one to another. Well, after 20 years or so, the young family, well, they were no longer so young. The girls were in their 20s, I think. Um, but this, this trio decided they no longer needed to live in a home that was built from a sense of loss. At the same time, they couldn't really fathom um, letting someone else live here. You know, it was such a personal place for them. So instead, the house was torn down, which is, you know, by our standards, pretty shocking to think of a concrete house coming down after just 21 years. But perhaps it's equally strange to think of a house made with paper that could stand for more than 21 years. To prove this point, the architect Shigeru Ban built Paper House in 1995. Ostensibly, it was his own weekend house, but he freely admits that he never has time to go off on a weekend jaunt and that really its purpose was to prove that this lowly material, the paper tube, was actually strong enough to hold up a roof. And subsequently, he's used paper tubes for many, many projects, both inside Japan, outside Japan, and especially for the many humanitarian works that he undertakes whenever disaster strikes, wherever it is in, in Japan, in Italy, everywhere. He's actually working on a project right now in the Ukraine. Um, and so in this house, you can see um, this is the plan and the dots represent the um, columns. So it has this, he made this S-shaped wall and uh, out of paper tubes. And in the upper um, left corner there, you see that's the bathroom. It has its own garden. And then the wall sort of swoops around and closes the sleeping area on the right side and then opens the public space out to the forest. And um, the house was enclosed by sliding um, window walls on all four sides, so it could be opened completely to its surroundings. Another non-urban example is the four by four house that was built in 2003. Now this house had a very unusual beginning. It started out in 2001 when Brutus, a popular magazine in Japan, had a kind of a contest. And what they asked were that um, readers could submit a postcard uh, that stated their dream architect. And then the editors picked one of these submissions and whoever won would be tasked with supplying the land and paying for the construction but Brutus would negotiate with the architect. So the winner was a, con a con construction company executive, and he had this tiny property overlooking the Seto Inland Sea and this burning desire to live in a house designed by Tadao Ando. So Ando responded with this concrete mini tower topped by a four meter uh, cubed four meter cube on top. And the private rooms are in the three levels below with the communal space in the um, inside the cube. And um, that's looking out towards the view. And clearly the client was unfazed by the idea of carrying groceries up to the top floor. But quite honestly, having visited the house, I can tell you that the views are spectacular. The light is magnificent, and you don't even realize there's a four lane highway behind the house. So these kinds of uh, 
innovations were extremely exciting to me as I reported them. But challenging city sites, you know, offer a whole other range of opportunities for designers. And um, this is a house located in Tokyo designed by Kazuyo Sejima. It's called House in a Plum Grove. And she designed it for a couple with two kids, one living grandmother and a very small plot that was dotted with plum trees. As you can see, the property abutted a garage on one side. And in fact, in back, you can barely see there's um, a small playground on the other. So um, most, and, and of course the client wanted to keep the trees, which she was able to do. Um, they were removed during construction. And this is a, taken shortly after construction and then planted in that sort of L-shaped slot of land. Um, and I've seen a photograph of the house more recently and they completely, um, they're all, they're enormous. So they, they're very happy in their transposed place. Um, anyhow, you know, faced with these kind of tight conditions, small space, most architects reaction would be divide the space as little as possible. Well, Sejima went in the opposite direction. She reasoned that the more rooms, the better. And so this very plain poker face facade conceals three stories that contains a variety of communal spaces, including a tea room, a library, and a rooftop bathroom, as well as individual rooms for everyone in the family. And um, the trick with the rooms was that she made them basically the size of the furniture. So here's the son in his bedroom, which is literally the size of his bed. Um, in, you can see part of the way she made it a more habitable space was first it has on the left, this big window out to the street. And then on the top right is a window that goes into his sister's study, which is of course the size of her desk. So they can call down to each other or, you know, send paper airplanes or whatever they want to do. Well, in closing, I want to leave you with one more house. This is called House Restaurant, and it was completed in um, 2022. It was designed by an architect named Junya Ishigami, who was um, who cut his teeth in Sejima's office. And I think he's one of the most fearless designers working in Japan today. So in this case, um, the commission came from a return client, a chef who had a large parcel of land in Yamaguchi prefecture. And he wanted um, to have one building that combined his home and his restaurant um, with the atmosphere of a wine, wine cellar. So, Instead of building upward with some kind of, you know, columns and beams or concrete walls, you know, in the more typical fashion, Ishigami dug huge holes into the ground and used those as formwork for poured in place concrete. So um, this was a pretty daring strategy because he really had no idea what the quality of the space was gonna be like until the concrete had cured and the dirt in between all of these concrete pieces had been removed. He had, he had initially envisioned smoothing out all of the concrete like it is on the, the rooftop there. But when the dirt came out and he saw this kind of nubbly texture and the orange coloring, he was so in love with it. He said, no, 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 let's just put a transparent sealant on it and, and that'll be just fine. And so um, what he created was a home on one side, a restaurant on the other, and you can see three, um, three uh, little courtyards in between that sort of buffer the private and public zones and enable um, daylight to come down to the middle of the building. So here is the family bathroom, which of course is the tub is sunken into the ground. And here is, um uh, the uh restaurant where you know patrons can sit and banter with the chef while he is preparing their meal 
Well, <clears throat> this is just a very small sampling of what's inside this book. I really encourage, no, I make that urge you to look inside at the other 90 plus houses. And as you'll see, each house tells a special story about the time when it was built, about the place that molded its form, and above all, about the people who brought it to life and made it a home. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you Naomi. Much. That was great. And uh, now we're going to turn it over to uh, Yoko and Naomi, who uh, are going to chat a little bit about uh, some of the uh, amazing houses. Yoko? Sure. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Naomi, for the wonderful presentation. Um, we are lucky to listen to your story, your insight, both about the, I guess, the uh, change of Japanese houses from 1945, and also a lot of backstories of each unique houses. We are also lucky, I believe, that you made it a point to make your private curriculum when you're a graduate student, <laughs> because when you didn't do that, we don't have that chance to listen to you and read a wonderful book. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So um, let me start with a question I think it is easy for you. I had a privilege to meet your daughter in New York last in, in your last event. And she told me that you often talk, you know, took her to the open houses and even gave her like an assignment of check the bathroom each time. Would you maybe talk a little about how going to these different houses with your family member, especially with your daughter, form your perspective to the houses and maybe to the perspective you to your book too? Sure. That's a great question. Um, well, so, you know, as children of an architect and turned journalist, my kids spent a lot of time in new buildings and um, I always had to make it interesting for them. So I'd give them little scavenger hunts, <laughs> or little, you know, look at this or, you know, and, you know, the wonderful thing about kids is they're so unfiltered. And I remember going to see one house where the bathroom was enclosed with four glass walls. And they were absolutely astounded. How could this be? How could you take a bath in a room with glass doors, glass walls, no solid walls? And, you know, it gave me um, that sense of wonder again about how magnificent and how clever and sometimes a little strange some of these houses could be. Um, but that perspective, I always appreciated and I always, um, you know, listened intently when they um, would report to me uh, what they had seen. Mm -hmm. So They're I encourage honest. anyone who's doing this, they should take their kids, take it. Make every you know day take my, take your kids to work day. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Take to the good ones. Well, some of them were <laughs> less good, but that was okay because they were very you know they and they didn't view it that way. In fact, uh -huh. sometimes I think some of the things that I would have thought was wow, that's a little strange. They were like, wow, that's so cool. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. yeah. Oh, great, great. Okay, so um, my next question is also something to do with the people who are in the house. And I noticed uh, by reading your book that the resident's perspective to the, to the house is often different from the way from which the public look at it. Like the sum of the houses look so stunned um, or reject kind of rejecting people from the outside, but the the people, the homeowners and residents look at in a different way. Could you um you know talk about maybe one or two examples in which that discrepancy is especially big and uh, give us some idea of why they are so different? So, you know, as I told you that in the 60s, um, the country was starting to do a lot of construction of various types. And um, this tendency to tear stuff down and replace it 
mm -hmm. kind of began then. And so the 60s, the 70s, there was a lot of construction. And a lot of times people didn't know what's going to go next door. And so they would build a, a home that had a, a blank wall to the street. And that was their way of protecting it. So if, you know, a 15 story, you know, apartment building went up next door, didn't really matter. If a gas station went up next door, didn't really matter. If a house that they thought was super ugly went, you know, again, they, they were insulated. And in those cases, um, the houses um, often usually would have um, an opening inside, you know, a very good example is, well, probably the one of the very first is in the the 70s chapter and it's um, designed by Tadao Ando. And um, it's fits in, it's in the middle of a three row houses and it has a completely concrete facade. And it has sort of two chunks of building with an open courtyard in the middle. And the two chunks of building are not connected. So it means that the clients have to go, if they wanna go from their bedroom to the kitchen, they have to go outside. And, you know, doesn't matter what the weather is, that's just the way this was set up. And I talked to Andosan about this and I said, you know, how is this, you know, how do they react and how, how do, how have they enjoyed living in the house? And he said they loved the house from the beginning. And, you know, that even though the house is of this hard industrial material, they are aware of nature at all times because mm -hmm. it is so much a part of their life. So that's the flip side of these mm -hmm. very strong exteriors is that it, there's usually something that compensates on the side, on the inside to create a connection to the outdoors. It's interesting to hear that both the public view and the residence view something to do with, I guess, the, how the Japanese culture and society is. And um, so that leads me to my next question um, about Bim Vendor's new Oscar-nominated movie, uh, Perfect Days. The, because it's showing right now in in the states, numerous articles pop up on my newsletters about these public toilets that are featured in this movie. I don't know if the audience had a chance to watch it, and I have to admit that I haven't watched it yet. But these are the a small, beautiful public toilets designed by very famous architects. So my question is that, you know, I somehow sensed like, you know, it, the very fact that these projects exist in Japan and people admire them and the Western culture like them to the extent to be a part of the movie um, has something parallel with the, with the project in your books. Could you maybe talk how you think about it? In terms of, is it a scale and size aspect that we're talking about, or yeah, the the the, the very fact that these, you know, the toilets are very humble structures. Yes, and the fact that this big organization, government organization, thought about making these humble project into sort of a, you know, um, entertainment. And mm -hmm. the fact that people do visit them, admire them, yes, um, is I feel it has some closer relationship in um to small houses when we think about their relationship to the Japanese society or culture. Right. Well, you know, I think that um one common theme is this idea of smallness and mm -hmm. how you know, quality is not connected to quantity in Japan, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. especially where space is concerned. And um, I think that, you know, in many ways, the public toilets are kind of like tea houses, because again, they're for very specific purpose and sequence of actions and movements. Um, and then, um, you know, talking to people who lived in 
who had lived in small houses. Uh, one of my favorite at-home essays in the book is by Rie Azuma, who grew up in a house called Tower House. And it's right on a central street in the middle of Tokyo. And it's a very, very, very small house, a stack of five tiny, and I mean tiny, triangular rooms. That's it. And then essentially the stairway becomes like the corridor feeding one at each level. And she told me, you know, people always ask me, what was it like to grow up there? And of course she has no basis of comparison, but you know, her stories were delightful, you know, sitting up in her room and if her parents had guests over, she could hear, was the conversation interesting? Then she could go downstairs. You know, while her mother was cooking, she could sit on the stairs because they doubled as seating, of course, mm -hmm. and do her homework. And so um, out of that smallness comes wonderful lifestyle opportunities. And, uh, you know, it's just a, a real gift in a lot of ways. Thank you. I, I love that story when I was reading it. it and it reminds me like a Rapunzel in the tower, but in a different way. You know, the, the, she is sort of uh, surrounded by this tower, but she experience it in a full, fully, you know, full way, both inside and in a, it, that tower has an interesting opening to the out, outside that allowed her to look at the the city, the, yes. the world in a sense, yes. Tremendously, and her father would always joke. Um, I remember um, I had a chance to meet him early on and he would, because initially his office was in the the basement of the house, and he would always joke that he had the shortest commute to get to the office because all he had to oh, do was yeah. walk down his stairs and there was an office. So, but it's also, and I think this does tie into the toilets as well, is that people in um, Tokyo for sure use the um, resources of the city. And so consequently, people people don't hesitate to use public washrooms in Japan and they're clean. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. they're now they're in Shibuya, at least there's some really clever um, bathrooms. And um, like, it, again, going back to the Asumas, you know, they could have lived in a suburb and had a bigger house plus mm -hmm. an hour and a half commute to get into central Tokyo. And Mr. Azuma and his wife made a very, definite decision they didn't want that lifestyle the lifestyle they wanted was the urban lifestyle and if they could only fit a refrigerator you know that could hold a day's worth of groceries then that's fine they would just go shopping every day and that's what they did yeah it, it's a you know they made choices and uh that let us tell the i guess the the lifestyle that they want to lead and uh a sort of um I don't know the thought system that they have about life you know the they, they don't mind that hardship they don't they and they don't consider necessarily the hardship it's a part of the life i think it's and, not a hardship at all i mean a lot of people who live in small homes tell me that one of their greatest pleasures is being able to sense the presence of other family members and if they lived in a big house where everyone had a private room and a closed door, you'd lose that. And also, you know, when you think about the traditional house where people sat on the floor and most things that they needed were within an arm's length. So that's also in the mind of a lot of people in Japan that that's a very comfortable way to live. So. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Um... Steve, if you don't mind, may I ask her one more question? Sure. Let's, uh, yeah, let's uh, yeah. ask another question and then we'll open it up for Q&A. And again, just want yes. to encourage people who have a question, please post it in the chat and then um, we will circle back to you and uh, and uh, ask you to repeat it for, th for the benefit of the audience. But uh, go ahead, Yoko. Thank you, Steve. So my last question was about your last project that you showed. Ishigamis. And the, you know, by looking at the different images of the project, I noticed that you, you know, the a large amount of early project, 50s and 60s, you know, yes, the pictures are black and white, but it they look 
a little darker, you know, and then it gets lighter and lighter, especially like in White Yu and Sejima's uh, Plum House. Mm -hmm. And then um, the this Western house has a very different look. And I wonder that if you think it is the beginning of different trend in Japanese house already, or it could be just in Ishigami's project, but do you have any comment about the future? Well, I mean, I think that um, Ishigami's work is very, I don't want to use the word experimental, but it's not something that most people are familiar with. And um, I think that whenever there's someone like that working in architecture, they tend to be, you know, give off sort of sparks of stimulation to other people. Yes. So I'm curious to see. I know um, the, the the project architect for the restaurant, house mm -hmm. restaurant, after that finished, he moved to Yamaguchi. Maybe he's from Yamaguchi. I don't know. But he moved to Yamaguchi and set up his own office. And I'm oh, okay. very eagerly waiting to see what comes out of what his office. Okay. Yeah. That would be on your next book. I think. Exactly. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you very much, Naomi, for this conversation. Thank and, you. Yeah. Great. Let's well, see. thank you. Thank you, both of you. And uh, we will actually turn open uh, the mic to uh, some of our audience members who've posted questions. Um, Let's start with Scott. Are you still online? Who had asked a question about zoning? We had a few uh, people ask something about how zoning uh, regulations affected housing. Scott, do you want to pose your question? Um, sure. Hi. Um, this um, it, right. This is a lovely way of not showing the book, but uh, it was a book um, published last year called Emergent Tokyo, and it discussed in part how uh, zoning laws in Tokyo have changed and evolved over time uh, and affecting both residential and commercial buildings. And so I was wondering if either of you had comments on how zoning laws in Tokyo or anywhere else for that matter um, have influenced um, the, you know, specifically residential buildings. Do you have any thoughts on that immediately, Yoko? Yes, the one thing, you know, the zone law did a lot of things, um, but one thing uh, in, in, the scale, in the scale of city, what it did, or what different laws did over the years, were the, um, the zone for the houses, especially the single family homes, and the details and uh, other more commercial buildings, started to be clearly separated compared to the condition before. And that made, at some point, um, Japanese houses um, tend to be more like a suburban Japanese, a sub suburban uh, Western homes. And that's one of the things that, you know, uh, if you go to Japan and just look at Kyoto and Tokyo, you don't see it. But majority of Japanese homes are built by prefabricated prefabrication manufacturers, and that changed the landscape of um, rural Japan. That's one thing that came to my mind. I mean, you know, there, like any place, the zoning is not consistent throughout Tokyo. Some parts have certain kind of zoning, some kind of parts have others. Um, there's a house that in the book, um, naturally lips that is built in basically a red red light zone in Shibuya, and you know we wouldn't really think of building a house there, but okay. So I think that there's a lot of a lot of freedom. Um, obviously, there are certain parts of Japan where um, things are very restrictive, and um, that's, um, but those are sort of pockets more than the uh, overall. You know, one of the main driving forces of a lot of um, issues where construction is concerned is the spread of fire. So for, you know, there are very, very few, almost no um, row houses because there has to be space between every house. 
And until fairly recently, one could not build timber at all in Tokyo. And now those rules have softened a bit. But um, so those kinds of restrictions, you know, um, tend to uh, have some impact. You know, if you look at a lot of neighborhoods in Tokyo, the there, and this again has to do with fire. There are you know large, broad avenues, and then making sort of outlining an area, and then in within that are smaller streets, and then within that are even smaller streets, and again. Um, those have to do with protecting uh, fire and making sure that there's access for emergency vehicles to everything. So I'm not sure if that quite answers your question, but, um, you know, zoning is a big topic. Naomi, uh, there's another question from uh, one of the participants about uh, influences of Western architects, such as Frank Lloyd Wright. I know Le Corbusier was a big influence on several of the architects that you covered. Can you talk both about um, Western influence on the architects that are covered in the book, as well as the influence of these houses to you know the world at large and architects outside of Japan? Like how well known are a lot of these structures and did it have an impact on the way others think about uh, design, uh, residential design, um, you know, from, you know, seeing some of these examples? Well, um, you're absolutely right. I would say that Le Corbusier had, um, well, he, there are three architects in the book who all apprenticed with him. And they, in turn, um, incorporated his concrete technology and a lot of his aesthetics and then of course, then they pass those on to their students and the people who worked for them. So that's how ideas tend to propagate in architecture. Um, but, you know, there was less, I would say, less direct influence of uh, some of the, you know, the Bauhaus. It was there for sure, but not as obvious, not as overt. Um, and, um, you know, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, I would not say he had a super broad impact on certainly on residential design. Again, there were people who worked for him and they continued to do their own practice. And if you look at their homes that they designed, one can see that uh, in influence, but it, I would not say that it had a huge impact. Um, more recently, I think that a lot of these Japanese houses are quite well known, at least among architects outside of Japan. and. Um, you know, it's hard to say that they translate into any uh, direct inspiration because the scale is so different. The, there are so many differences about the building um, environment, but um, they're certainly very admired. I also think that this Western influence to the Japanese houses or Japanese architecture is not the one way, but both way relationship. Um, the, the Japanese contemporary homes are attract, you know, attract a lot of attention from Western world, partly because at the beginning of modernization, uh, the people in the West thought that the Japanese traditional architecture has an essence that uh, could be made into very modern houses by being a um, post and beam structure, like a, a steel structure in modern um, commercial buildings. So that's another reason why that, yes, we see the Western influence in Japanese houses, but that influence happened because of the other way influence were there at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, I see that uh, Patricia has uh, uh, asked a question in the uh, chat about uh, the uh, the rest of Tokyo. So Patricia, do you wanna uh, ask, you, ask your question uh, on camera? Hey, thank you for your talk. Uh, I am indeed living in a spacious two LDK here in Tokyo. It's huge. Uh, these are inspiring and unique, these wonderful homes, but what about the rest of the Tokyo architecture, which is a complete hodgepodge to my eyes? I enjoy it living in Tokyo, and I hope Ms. Pollock will give a bit of insight into the 99% of the rest of the buildings, uh, tall order 
I admit. Thank you. Well, um, my feeling about Japan, especially Tokyo, is if one looks at Tokyo with Western eyes, inevitably there's going to be disappointment. Because, as I said at the beginning, a lot of what we are familiar with that makes a city feel united, feels unified, feels like buildings are in concert with each other, um, a lot of those cues are absolutely missing. But I think that what one has to do is retrain one's eye. And you have to retrain your eye to look at the small things and look at the small places and the small spaces. And maybe it's the way, you know, wood and concrete join together. Um, maybe it's a single window. Maybe it's a roji walkway. But once you start to focus on the small things, it's just abundant with beauty and magic. Well, yes, that's what I tell my tour clients as well. Thank you. Sure. Oh. Great. This is a um, question that has come up uh, from Kat Hoy uh, relates to um, uh, family structure and how that influences design. Kat, do you, are, do you have your camera ready and can you um, ask your question? Um, hi, thank you. Sorry, I can't get my video to work. <laughs> so we're just okay. going to move past that. <laughs> Um, yeah, my question was, so you started off your talk and you were talking about how um, as these homes were being built, they were moving towards the nuclear family model in design with respect to the interior spaces. And I was wondering if you were seeing a resurgence in multi-generational living as part of some of these more contemporary home designs. Um, I don't really see a lot of resurgence to multi-generational living, but as here, we're seeing uh, living spaces for families of every possible size combination. Um, I just wrote an article about a house that was designed for one woman, you know. Um, so as the social structure changes, and it does change, albeit a bit more slowly in Japan, um, that is reflected in residential design. Um, there was a trend that's probably still pretty active in these share houses, which is just what it sounds like people deciding to live together um, in these, these share shared homes. Um, and there was one I visited where if you lived in this home, you had to like to grow vegetables because they grew all their own food. Um, that was like in suburban Tokyo. And so as with everything in Japan, instead of making it bigger, they just make more variations. Uh, Naomi, I want to um, kind of build on, uh, you know, something that that brought up for me in, in um, you know, looking through your book, I was really interested to see what aspects of traditional uh, architecture and home design in particular uh, were really resilient and, you know, remained even within some of these very modern structures. And a couple examples would be, you know, the Gencon, um, you know, not all of them had a, an entryway where people took off their shoes, but many uh, actually did have them. And the bath design, you know, the Ofuro, the typical Japanese uh, ba bath and bathing area, although they were enclosed, you know, some of them had, you know, more open air kinds of structures, others didn't. And then a third one is um, the garden, which, you know, many of these uh, houses seem to really emphasize the interaction between a garden space and the residential, the living space to the point where uh, many had removable walls and, uh, you know, things that, you know, really kind of engaged, you know, brought interior to exterior, you know, to the, you know, focus of Yoko's work as well. I'm interested to hear your thoughts about, you know, some of those things that were traditional that carried over and some of the things that were traditional that maybe didn't, uh, weren't quite as resilient in design. Yoko, would you like to um, speak to that first? Sure. Um, maybe I can start about the relationship between outside and inside. And that's one of the things that the Japanese traditional houses have had for many years, from the 7th or 8th century. And it's regardless if it is a residential or commercial, whatever. The, so people are used to be in the nature. And that's 
probably one of the reasons why the Tadawa and those clients didn't mind going out in the uh, in the lane to go to the another side of the house. They think it's it's something that um, need to be a part of your life, and you live that way. And over the years, Japanese people built that uh, sort of a tools of Fusuma and Shoji to be able to feel the outside as a part of inside. And at the same time, in a traditional version, the house is built so that it is a part of the nature. It is a part of the landscape. Uh, so I think it's almost the other way around in the Western culture. You build a house mm -hmm. and create the garden according to it. And I still see that uh, remnants of our traditional culture in the modern house, like in Andos, or even in White U, which is very closed. It still has a close relationship with the port house and the house itself. Well, also, it's, it's very closed, but that also speaks to the general feeling about privacy in Japan, mm -hmm. which is that the house um, is very oftentimes very private in terms of the exposure to the outside and access and that's a very traditional idea um but within the house privacy among family members is much much more open so that again is something you know and it's interesting going back to what i was saying at the beginning about the kengaku kai that i would go to and i would go to these houses and because i had minka on my mind i would say oh my gosh that's just like in a minka and the architects would say Huh? And I would say, but you take your shoes off just like you would when you're stepping up to go into a minka. Oh yeah, I guess that's true. You know, so some of these habits are so tremendously ingrained, and um, and that people don't even recognize that actually that's these true. traditional ideas that still exist. Another thing about outdoor space, which I always found fascinating, is that. Um, people really like to dry their laundry in the fresh air. And the number of houses I've visited where there's a little space somewhere next to the bathroom where the washing machine might be so people could just hang their clothes. That was a very explicit request in so many cases. And again, I think it gets back to what Yoko was saying that you know that connection to nature even in the city, matters so much to people. Great. Uh, well, we are kind of approaching the end of the time that we told people that program would run, but let us take one more question and then we'll move to close. And um, I also have asked the uh, the speakers if they would stay after a little bit after we come to a formal closing of the program and just engage in a little bit of conversation if people want to stick sure. around a bit. But uh, Eleanor, are you still on on uh, on the call and can you ask your question about design? I think uh, in particular, it's interesting to hear about how, um, you know, things that are possible in Japan may or may not be possible in the US or California. Do you want to ask your question? I can hear you. Uh, I wonder if you would elaborate on the zoning question and how building will do that. Are you having something to me? It's a little wobbly. Oh, I am wobbly. I'm balancing. Um, yeah, I'm in Northern California, and uh, no home could be built where a room intended as a bedroom was the size of a bed, or probably not even an office the size of a desk, and uh, not to mention paper columns supporting a building. So I wonder if you would speak to that sort of thing in addition to the remarks that you made earlier about space. Thank you. Well, one thing that, and this kind of gets back a little bit to um, Yoko's comment or question before, um, there is no minimum space size in Japan. And um, there are, you know, of course there are handicap issues in, in uh, public buildings and making sure that every accessibility is an important feature. And they, it's very um, 
critical in public structures, but it, within homes, there's actually not much regulation for minimum size. And that includes the room size as well as the house size. So part of the reason that so many small houses crop up in Japan, this is just one of many, is that um, often the um, inheritance taxes are exorbitant. And oftentimes when the parents pass, the children have to either sell the house to pay the inheritance tax, or they have to sell a piece of land. And sometimes that means taking down the house and rebuilding it on a new piece of land and then selling this sliver of land. And people will buy the slivers and they will build on it. Now, you know, one of the nice things about that is that I think in many ways, architect designed houses in Japan are, um, they're more available to people. So younger people, you know, can build a house because that land isn't gonna be very expensive, you know, relatively speaking. Um, there are other parcels that are not very desirable if they're next to the, you know, train tracks, next to a cemetery. So it becomes something that actually is uh, kind of nice that this becomes available. But um, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of laws in America that just don't apply in Japan. So, but one thing I will say, um, Japan's um, earthquake code, I'm sure is pretty close to California's, if not even more um, strict. And every time there's a major event, the code gets tighter and the architects throw up their hands and say, oh my gosh, what are we gonna do? But in fact, those kinds of restrictions become actually a stimulus for them in a lot of cases, so. Great, That's well, thank you. you. No, no, Did no. you wanna add something, Yoko? Uh, yes, I wanted to add that this is sort of a minute and a lot of restriction in small houses. Um, I noticed in Naomi's book that the architects take it like a challenge and they uh, resolve these in a very creative way, which might be one of the reasons why that the small houses are so unique in Japan. Definitely. Well, um, let us wrap up the formal portion of the program. And I want to extend a huge thank you to Naomi and Yoko for, you know, sharing your expertise today. Uh, you know, I, I have learned many things just listening to the program and, and going through your book. Uh, a few things I am particularly glad about, you know, and, and speaking of in terms of size, you know, one of the, the challenges I have uh, being six feet, three inches tall is that it takes me a little while. I bump my head on the, um, you know, the, the door, the door jam a few times before I remember to duck before I go into every room. And I'm glad to say that recently, you know, the, the door size has increased uh, to the point in Japan where I, I don't actually have to remember that quite, quite as often in every building, but um, that's one good way. I think that the standards have evolved. But uh, I do want to say thank you to everybody who joined our program today. Uh, the Japan Society of Northern California has a very active schedule of uh, programs and events. And uh, this is one uh, that kind of falls within a series that we're doing called Traditional Arts in Modern Japan. Uh, we have more programs coming up uh, like that in the future, some of which are in person, some of which are online, and some of which are hybrid. Uh, over the next few weeks, we have a couple things which I hope some of you will also be able to join. Uh, uh, recommend that you sign up for our mailing list, uh, keep an eye on our website to see what kinds of programs are coming up. And we would really like to thank um, you know, Naomi and Yoko for coming and sharing their expertise today. And we hope that uh, many of you will continue to find other programs that we're doing and uh, uh, come take, take part in them as well. Building bridges between the United States and Japan since 1905. Japan Society.